Hello and welcome. In our lesson today, we are going to discuss food tests which feature in the practical paper of biology. Now, this is actually part three of practical questions on nutrition. If you haven't managed to watch part one and two, please do so. I will link them below. We are going to talk about food tests. Now, these are tests that are carried out to identify different food substances. We'll go through the procedure. We'll go through the observations that you can make. And lastly, what conclusions are you supposed to draw from the observation? Now, students tend to have this belief that questions featuring food tests are easy. They are not. Okay, they can be easy, but with a lot of students, you find that the way they score the marks is not as much as they had hoped so. And the reason is because most are unaware of the marking points of what you're supposed to do in order to score. And this is why I'm here today, to take you through the key points that you're supposed to ensure are incorporated in your answers and what to avoid at all costs. So stay tuned. Food tests. Now, food tests simply means tests that are carried out with specific reagents to find out the identity of a certain food substance. So there are six common ones. We have that of starch, reducing sugars, non-reducing sugars, lipids, proteins, and lastly, ascorbic acid or vitamin C. So we'll go through these six. Now the first one, starch. Now, when testing for starch, iodine is the reagent that is used. So whenever you see iodine, you know, sometimes you get practical questions whereby you're told to identify the test that is supposed to be carried out based on the reagents provided. So if you see iodine, then you're definitely testing for starch. Now, what is the procedure that is involved? This is it. To 2 ml of the food substance, add 3 drops of iodine solution. Now, I want to mention two things over here. Usually when you're giving a solution, it's labeled. So the solution could be labeled as A, G, H, you know, it could be labeled as anything, but it's labeled. So when you write the procedure, you're supposed to mention to 2 ml of the food substance G or the solution X, you are supposed to mention the label the food substance was given. Now, these are the rules that we talked about at the beginning of the lesson. Now, when talking about the quantity of iodine solution, some books will have written two to three drops, you know, or a few drops. You have to commit yourself. So it's three drops. Don't give an approximate value. Just stick to three drops of iodine solution. And then what you're supposed to do? Shake and observe the color change. Now, I find that with different books, the procedure can change in a certain way. But I believe that this is complete but at the same time it's shortened enough for you to remember so if you would like to note down what is on the screen kindly pause the video and do so now moving on to the observations now when doing this test when you're testing for starch using iodine there are only ever two observations that can be possible so number one if starch is present you're going to see a blue black color now, this is simply a blue color that is so deep, it's close to black. Now, this is the correct color change. So, blue hyphen black. But if starch is absent, what will happen is that the brown color of iodine will not change. So, how do you phrase this? The brown color of iodine is retained. Don't talk about the color does not change. There are no observable changes whatsoever. No. Write down that it's actually the brown color of iodine that does not change or is retained. Moving on to the next test, that of reducing sugars. Now, reducing sugars are tested using a reagent called Benedict solution. Now, Benedict solution contains copper 2 ions, which are the ones that are responsible for the beautiful blue color it has. Now, if reducing sugars are present, what happens is that the copper 2 ions present in Benedict's solution are reduced to copper 1 ions. And therefore, what happens? You observe a color change. But if uh, reducing sugars are absent, then the copper 2 ions will continue to become present and therefore the blue color is retained. Moving on to the procedure. To 2 ml of the food substance, let's say X, Add an equal amount of Benedict solution. Now, I want to mention something. In a few books, you'll notice that the unit of uh, 
measurement used is cubic centimeters. Now, either is correct, millimeters or cubic centimeters. One millimeter is equal to one cubic centimeters. So if you talk about two ml, two cubic centimeters, it's the same volume. But I would recommend you use two ml. Now, the reason for this is sometimes students forget and instead of writing two cubic centimeters, they write two centimeters or two centimeters square. And this makes the procedure wrong. Now, if the procedure is wrong, observation and conclusion are not marked. So the whole column becomes wrong. So 2 ml is easier, but at the end of the day, it's up to you. Now, one other thing I'd also like to make a note of is the procedure. In some books, for example, in Kelby, you find that the procedure is into a clean test tube, put 2 ml of food substance, add an equal amount of Benedict solution and such. But I find that it's easier for you to just go straight to the point by setting to 2 ml of the food substance, add an equal amount of Benedict solution, and you are done. You're clearly making it clear that you're using 2 ml of the food substance, and then you are adding 2 ml of Benedict solution onto it. Next step, heat to boil and observe the color change. Now, when heating, it's recommended you use a water bath. And the reason is so, as you can see, the sequence of color changes that occurs. Never talk about warming the mixture. Don't warm. In fact, we are not warming. We will actually be heating the solution until it boils. Now, moving on to the observations. So there are four observations that can be made. Number one, either you could see the color changing from blue to green. This simply means that reducing sugars are present, but in small amounts. If you get a yellow color, it means that there is a moderate amount of reducing sugars present in your food sample. What about if you get an orange or brown color? This means that there are high amounts of reducing sugars present in your food sample. Lastly, what if there are actually no reducing sugars present? Then you're going to get a blue color. Actually, you're not going to get a blue color. The blue color of Benedict's solution does not change, is retained. So if you were to heat it and still remain with a blue color, then that will mean that reducing sugars are absent. Now let's move on to the non-reducing sugars. Now if you look at the last two steps involved in the procedure, you'll note that they are similar to what was involved in the reducing sugars. But there are certain steps that are added initially. Now let's look at the first one. To 2 ml of food substance X, add three drops of hydrochloric acid now let me just remind you of something all monosaccharides that is glucose galactose and fructose are reducing sugars that means that they have the ability to reduce copper two ions present in benedict solution to copper one ions therefore bringing about a color change when you talk about disaccharides disaccharides can either be reducing sugars or non-reducing sugars. Now, a good example of a disaccharide, which is also a reducing sugar, is maltose. So, maltose can also reduce the copper two ions present in Benedict solution, therefore bringing about the color change. Now, sucrose, on the other hand, is a non-reducing sugar. This simply means that sucrose cannot reduce the copper two ions by itself. So what happens is that you have to first break it down into its constituent monosaccharides. Kizungu mingi, but this simply means that if you break down sucrose, you end up having glucose plus fructose. Now these two will now be the ones that will reduce the copper two ions in Benedict's solution. So this is the reason why hydrochloric acid is important because it hydrolyzes the sucrose. It breaks down the sucrose. Now moving on to step two, boil the mixture for a few minutes and let it cool. Now two things of note, don't talk about warming the mixture, it's boiling or heating the mixture. And another thing is, it's very, very important for you to mention that after boiling, you will cool the mixture before proceeding to the next step. Add sodium hydrogen carbonate dropwise until fizzing stops so essentially what you'll be doing is that you'll be taking sodium hydrogen carbonate solution adding it one drop at a time until when fizzing stops so fizzing is simply bubbling or the production of a gas now taking you to chemistry 
If you react sodium hydrogen carbonate with an acid such as hydrochloric acid, you're going to form carbon-4 oxide gas. So the fizzing or the bubbling is as a result of carbon-4 oxide. Now, the reason why sodium hydrogen carbonate is added is so that it can neutralize the hydrochloric acid. So when fizzing stops, that means that all of the acid has been used up. Now, the last two steps are similar to what was done in the reducing sugars. So going to the observations, again, just like with the reducing sugars, there are four possible observations. Now, if you have a color change from green to yellow or to orange, then that means that reducing sugars are present, only that they are in varying amounts. Now, I want to say this. If you're having a challenge in noting down the correct sequence of color changes, because you'll find that sometimes when you hit, you can clearly see the colors changing. You see it as green first and then changes to yellow, orange as such. Now, if you have a difficulty in knowing the correct sequence, then I'd advise you to just write the final color change. For example, setting it as color changes to brown or color changes to green as such without mentioning the sequence. What if the blue color of Benedict's solution is retained? Then that means that sugars are absent. Proceeding to proteins. Now, proteins are tested using sodium hydroxide and copper 2 sulfate solution. Now, you find that if you are provided with reagents and you can clearly see a, a container labeled as 10% sodium hydroxide solution or 1% copper 2 sulfate solution, then you're definitely testing for proteins. Now, the procedure to 2 ml of the food substance, add an equal amount of 10% sodium hydroxide solution and shake. Add 1% copper 2 sulfate solution dropwise and shake after every drop. Now, this is very important. You are adding one drop at a time of copper 2 sulfate solution. And after every drop, shake to note whether there's any color change. Now, there are two possible observations. Either you'll note a purple color, which means that proteins are present, or the blue color of copper 2 sulfate is retained. Now, this means proteins are absent. So don't talk about the color changing to blue. It's not. It was already blue in color as a result of the copper 2 sulfate solution. But it's retaining the color. This simply means that the color is not changing from blue. On to the last one. Testing for vitamin C or ascorbic acid. Procedure to 2 ml of DCPIP solution. Add the food substance dropwise. Now, when testing for vitamin C, the reagent that is used is DCPIP, which stands for dichlorophenol endophenol. Now, I would like you to make a note of this. For all the food tests that we have discussed so far, you take the food substance, the food solution, and then add whatever reagent you're using onto it. But for ascorbic acid, it's actually the reverse. You are measuring out 2 ml of DCPIP solution. Now, this could also be 1 ml as uh, indicated in KLB books. And then adding the food substance onto it drop wise. So you're adding the food solution one drop at a time, then shaking and observing to see if there's any color change after every drop. Now, before we proceed to the observations, I would just like to make a note of this DCPIP solution is blue in color. So there are two possible observations. Number one is that if vitamin C is absent, then the blue color of DCPIP will be retained, is retained. But if vitamin C is present, then DCPIP is decolorized. This simply means that it changes from blue to colorless. And there we have it. We are finally over with our discussion on food tests. I hope you've made a note of all the rules and all the things that you're supposed to include when answering. Thank you for tuning in and I wish you the best in all your practical exams. See you next time.